And now we're going to read about him in Titus, the second chapter, the 11th through the 14th verse, not the 15th, just through the 14th. Titus 2, chapter 11, or verses 11 through 14. You'll find it on page uh, 637. I'll wait till you get there. Okay. I'll read in English and then Kalabe uh, san, would you read it in English? Uh, Nihongo. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. ばいさ。ちょっと先生、あの、ケチ。ケトセンで、あの、2章11節から14節まで。全ての教習、神の恵みが現れた。そして私たちを導き、信心と思いの情欲とを捨てて、慈しみ深く、正しく。このように生活し、祝福に満ちた望みすなわち大いなる神に私たちの救い主キリストイエスの栄光の出現を待ち望むようにと教えているこのキリストが私たちのために Sensei. Can Sensei joins me? We're going to be talking about grace this morning. But one of the greatest illustrations of grace in the Bible is the story of David and Mephibosheth. Can you say that, Mephibosheth? <laughs> that's why nobody named it. That's why, Daniel, you weren't named Mephibosheth. <laughs> Now David had made a covenant with his friend Jonathan, who also happened to be King Saul's son. And in that covenant, David promised to show kindness to Jonathan's family. And sometime after Saul, King Saul, and Jonathan died, David had become king. David decided to make good on his promise. In searching, he found that Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth, who was lame and lived in the land of Lodabar. Now, Mephibosheth had done absolutely nothing to deserve the favor of King David. Nevertheless, David sent for him, welcomed him into the palace, restored his family's land, that's King Saul's land, 
and assign servants to till the soil and harvest the crops for him. Then David said to Mephibosheth, As for you, Mephibosheth, you will eat at my table and live as if you were one of my sons. If you want to read that story, you can turn later on today to uh, 2 Samuel 9. But notice something. Notice the grace that David extended towards Mephibosheth was not a one-time occasion. David's grace to him was continual. Mephibosheth remained in the palace and was treated as one of the king's own sons. This is really a wonderful picture, you will, of the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. And it reminds me that I have to repeat the simple definition of grace. Remember, it's the undeserved love and favor of God toward falling and sinful man. We don't deserve salvation through Jesus Christ. We don't deserve a relationship where Almighty God is our Father. We don't deserve eternal life and a promised home in heaven. You know, there's a man that used to belong to the Salvation Army who said something I'd like to. He said, I deserved to be damned. I deserve to be in hell. But God interfered. That's grace. That's grace. We don't deserve eternal life and a promised home in heaven. But thanks to grace, the undeserved love and favor of God, these things are a reality for those of us who have come to know Jesus as their own personal Savior. Now, grace is visible in all aspects of our Christian life. It's seen in our salvation, our transformation, our sanctification, our edification, and our glorification. And each of these truths is covered in this power-packed portion of God's Word. So this morning what I would like to do is walk you through this passage as we look together at God's great grace. And I'd like you to open your Bible to 637, page 637. 
And we'll uh, keep it open so you can see what we're talking about. We'll start in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, and examine God's grace and our salvation. We read, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men and women. <laughs> In these verses, Paul clearly states that God's grace has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Now, the Bible makes it really clear that mankind needed this great grace because Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word all is not just inserted for grammatical reasons, it is in the original Greek. There's no one who is innocent. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were born lost in, need of, in the need of salvation. That is deliverance from sin and, ju and uh, judgment. God, through Christ, has made a way for each one of us to be saved. You see, the only answer for sin is Jesus, because the only substance powerful enough to wash away our sin is the precious blood of Jesus. <laughs> now let's picture picture language, but I want to repeat it. You see, the only answer for sin is Jesus, because the only substance, if you will, powerful enough to wash away all of our sin is the blood of Jesus. Well, God's great gift of grace, the verse says, has appeared to all men. What does it mean? Well, it means that Jesus has appeared on the scene. He paid the penalty for our sins. And because of that, we have the opportunity to be saved. Now, if you're already saved, then praise God for His great grace. You can't say, well, I really worked at it and I really made it. I'm, I'm, I'm okay now. Can't say that. You have to praise God for His great grace. That undeserved love and favor for you from Him. But understand also that grace doesn't just end with salvation. God's grace, the undeserved love and favor of God, is also evident in the process of transformation. 
で神様の恵みつまり神様から我々は何の遺産も死もないのに愛と行為を賜ったのですがそれは我々を作り変えてくださるその家庭の中にも明らかに見られます。Look with me at verse 12 as we examine the work of God's grace in transforming us. Verse 12 teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present world. お気づきください。十二節が教えているのは、信心とこの世の情欲とにを捨てて、慎み深く、正しく、信心深く、この世で生活するようにと教えているのです。Now, when I read that, I realize that what it says is we need to be changed just to live in this world today. ここを読むなら、我々は神様が我々を作り変えられたいように、Now, of course, we're not saved by our works, rather, we're saved by the washing of regeneration. Regeneration literally means the new birth. When this new birth occurs, when you accept Christ as your Savior, there's a change. Second Corinthians 5 17 says this Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things passed away, behold, all things have come new. Now, when this transformation takes place in me or you, there are some things we begin to avoid. Things like ungodliness and worldly lusts. We begin to understand that there are things that we should have no part in. There are places we shouldn't go, there are things we shouldn't do. So we have to fight the temptation and the desires that come naturally to us from our old nature. We need to also remember that we're not of this world, and therefore we should not love the world nor the things of the world. So we need to avoid the things of this world and honor God. For example, we need to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. So you say, well, worldly lusts. Oh, I don't do those sexual problems. No, no, I, don't, I don't do that. How about this? Do you love money? That's a worldly lust. Do you love pleasure? That's a worldly lust. Oh. Guilty, huh? But it's not enough to simply avoid the bad things. There are also some things that we should strive to accomplish. The verse also says that we're expected to live sensibly, righteously, 
and godly. My life and your life should honor our Father and point people to our Savior. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Let's repeat that when Ken Sensei say, My life, my life, and your life should honor our Father and point people to Jesus. We should be devoted and obedient to our Lord and follow and obey His Word. But listen to me carefully now. This is only possible, only possible through the grace of God that brings about a transformation in my life and your life. Yes, grace brings deliverance and a change in our lives. But that's not all. Because consider this, if you will, grace also brings us hope. In verse 13, verse 13 we read, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You and I currently live in a world filled with trouble and disorder. It's everywhere we look. It's all over our newspapers. In our television. There's trouble everywhere. You know, when I was a boy, we had two wars. Europe and the Pacific. Now, there are over 30 wars going. And people are looking for hope. But I'm here to tell you that the only hope lies in Jesus Christ. He's our blessed hope. And one day we are promised that through God's promise through God's word that Jesus is coming back. This is no myth, this is no fairy tale. The same Jesus that came and made a way for us to be saved will come back someday. After Jesus was resurrected, he spent a few days with his followers, and then he ascended to his rightful place at the right hand of the Father.
Acts 1.11 says, This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go back to heaven. That promise rings true today and we're closer than ever before. The day is coming, and I hope it's very soon, when Jesus will split that eastern sky with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet, and he will call you, and he will call me, all of his children, back home. その日は必ず来るのです。そして早く来てほしいと私は願っています rise up out of this world of sorrow and we'll meet him in the air and the Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This, my loved ones, is our blessed hope. This is our great expectation. But this hope, this hope we have is not because we deserve it. It's because of God's great grace. But while we look for that day, let, remind you that, let me remind you of this that there's still work to do until Christ returns. Not only is there work for us to do for him, there's a work that he continues to do in us. Look with me at verse 14 as we consider God's grace and our sanctification. We read, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar, that's a special people, zealous of good works. Now the words Jesus gave himself for us speaks of the salvation that we examined a little bit earlier. But we're also told that Jesus gave himself for us in order to purify unto himself a peculiar, a special people of good works. This shows it's this shows us that sanctification is a work of God's grace. The word sanctification has the idea of purifying something so it can be set apart for the exclusive use of the Lord. Jesus wants us, his people, to be purified and used for the Lord's glory. 
イエス様は我々神の民を清めて神の栄光のために用いられることを望んでおられるのです。But remember, while sanctification begins at the point of salvation, it does not end there. しかし忘れないでください。清くなること、成果は救われた時に始まるのですが、それで終わるわけではないのです。It's a continual process in our lives. それは我々の生涯にわたって続くプロセス、過程なのです。Story. The story is told of a young girl who accepted Christ as her Savior and applied in membership, for membership in a local church. And an old deacon interviewed her and he said, Were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus into your life? 年老いた羊の一人が質問しました。あなたが主イエスを自分の人生に受け入れた,受け入れた前、あなたは罪人であったと認めますか ?Yes, sir, she replied. はい、そうです。とその少女は、その女性は答えました。Well, are you still a sinner? よあなたは今は、今でも罪人ですか ?She said, To tell you the truth, sir, I feel I'm a greater sinner than ever. 真実を申しますと、私は今の方が以前よりにも増して、より罪深い罪人であると感じるのです。Then what real, what real change have you experienced? The old deacon asked. 年老いた羊はサタンを尋ねました。では、どのような、まあ、変化を実際に経験しておられますか She explained, I don't really quite know how to explain it, sir, except I used to be a sinner running after sin. Now that I'm saved, I'm a sinner running away from sin. The story says she was received into the fellowship of the church and proved by her consistent life that she was truly. See, God continues to work in the life of His children and me. Verse 14 tells us something else. That Jesus desires for us to be zealous for good deeds. In other words, He wants us to be enthusiastic about doing good deeds. May we live each day with a great desire to honor our Savior. Beloved, God doesn't just save us and leave us alone. He saves us for a purpose. Jesus has begun the work of sanctification in our lives. And He'll continue to do that work. Until it's complete. This is just another aspect, marvelous aspect, of God's great grace. So, summarizing, God's grace brings salvation. And it's only, it's only because God offers us this marvelous free gift that we can be born again through Jesus Christ. And 
Then God's grace brings us transformation. As soon as we're born again, Jesus begins a work in us. We're changed and transformed. Then God's grace brings hope. He's our blessed hope. This hope is possible because of grace. Finally, God's grace brings sanctification. Yes, God has a plan for us. He saved us and set us apart in order to bring Him glory. Notice, all of these things are possible only because of God's grace. What's God's grace? It's His love and favor that we absolutely don't deserve. Keep that in your mind. God's grace has been given to us. His love, His favor, has been given to us and we didn't even deserve it. We were going to sing, but we don't have time. Let me, let me just read to you, though. The verse. It's a song. It's actually number 344. 344. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Well, you have your books open. We'll sing one verse of it, Mr. Tsuchiya. Yes. <laughs> Salvation Army who said I deserve to be damned I deserve to be in hell ah but God interfered <laughs> by his grace I have it all I have it all amen <laughs>